it could take one cycle to get to a million dollars. Why would you sell your Bitcoin? It doesn't really make sense to get rid of your Bitcoin, your pristine asset in order to buy something like real estate. We could easily see the US dollar collapse by 2035. 90% of people aren't going to have adopted Bitcoin by the time it's at a million dollars. A lot more companies, a lot more investors, prominent investors are going to wrap their heads around Bitcoin. They're going to try looking at it. They're going to figure it out and they're going to get their companies to buy it or they're going to buy it for themselves. I think CBDCs are going to come. They're going to flop. They're not going to do as well as governments think they will. Central banks think they will. And they're going to be forced into buying Bitcoin. All roads lead to Bitcoin. CBDCs are going to eventually lead to Bitcoin. When people see that, oh, my money is being canceled after six months or I'm getting a negative yield on my savings. Why would they want to continue holding their CBDC? Once there's 10% adoption, the other 90% are going to adopt very quick. You don't need to buy real estate because on a Bitcoin standard, house prices will continue to go down forever. research about you uh, what you have been up to the the last few months where you have not been on my channel <laughs> so i've seen that you actually made a youtube channel and that you are actually leveling up your uh, bitcoin education game you have the twitter i think the instagram you also have and now you also have a youtube channel where there's a lot of great stuff there um what, what, what's what's been like the last few months where you have not been on the channel what were some of your highlights personally and maybe also in bitcoin honestly um part of the reason why i even made the channel was because of because of our because of our lad po our last podcast uh, the last uh, conversation that we had I, every conversation obviously it gives you it, it leaves you with something but I feel like our every conversation is very valuable I feel like our conversation really gave me that that push but I've been working a lot on uh, educating myself learning more um, reading more books uh, I I read a couple of books I read. Um, I read the internet of money back there. I don't know if you can see it, but it's back there. Um, and I, I've been just exploring deeper, going going as far as I can. I actually, uh, I used to post only, uh, I used to post Bitcoin content on my Instagram, but now I separated them as well. So it, a lot of tweaks going on, a lot of small changes there. Uh, massive changes going going forward too though. So. Amazing. I love it a lot. And I, I stumbled upon your channel and I was like, let's let's see what the, the popular videos there. Uh, and I think there's one video that really uh, stood out to me. And the title was, I, I fit here, most people will ignore Bitcoin until it's reached 1 million or something like that it was. Uh, and it was fascinating for me because when, when we think about 1 million, there's a lot of money coming in there. Uh, and also there's a lot of attention, like when you think, when you think about the attention that Bitcoin got when it reached over 10,000 and then it should shot up to like 18,000 or something like that at 2017, a lot of people already talked about it. We did not have that in 2021. I feel like that really big no. talking point. Um, why do you think that most people will ignore it or like, uh, what, what, how do you define most people? Is it like 80% or 50%? I would say, uh, I think 90% of people aren't going to have adopted Bitcoin by the time it's at a million dollars. 90% of people are going to be forced into it because you have to, I mean, it's like everything else, right? It's like every other asset. 10% will own 90% of the asset. It's like the Pareto principle, 20% own 80%. Uh, the top 20% uh, have 80% of the production or the top 20, cu top 20 customers out of 100 will give you most of your sales. It's the same thing, right? The top... 1% will own 99% of the Bitcoin. Top 90% will own, uh, sorry, top 10% will own 90% of the Bitcoin. Top, uh, the, the rest of that 90% will own the, the 10%. And I don't even, I think it'll be even lower than that, actually. I think it'll be lower than 10%, just because as the later you get, the more coins are being locked away and they'll never come back to the economy again, right? Both of us have our own stacks. You've had conversations with tons of people a lot of these people are veg very educated on how Bitcoin works. And why would you sell your Bitcoin unless you have something better? Uh, I, I kind of uh, dove a little deeper with MicroStrategy. You had a great conversation with uh, with Michael Saylor, by the way. Um, I do dove a little deeper into that. I feel like maybe that's MicroStrategy and maybe another company that can print Bitcoin. They're the only ones who may be worth investing in instead of Bitcoin. Right over time, it doesn't really make sense to get rid of your Bitcoin, your pristine asset, in order to buy something like real estate, where you have to rent it out. Where you have real estate values are going to decrease significantly over time, right? 
and I mean over time you can you can see that pretty easily. So yeah, it's it's uh, it's so obvious when when you go deeper that. Um, but let's f focus a little bit on that one million. Uh, uh, it's it seems like when you really research Bitcoin, uh, for me it feels like one million is easily reachable. It's not that far away. Um, when you already see like, okay, there's Michael Salen, he's now kind of orange billing uh, Michael Dell. Uh, and this is just like one small example. We don't know how many behind the scenes talks, maybe even like Larry Fink has with really big companies or like other people have that we don't even know about who is our OGs and don't want to be on the surface. Uh, like there are a lot of things that we don't know about who can really bring billions into Bitcoin, really, really drive up the price without any mass uh, adoption without any uh, really retail adoption. How do you think uh, we get to this this one million uh, thing? Is it just like more of, of the same that we have now? Uh, we have the ETF. The ETF is probably uh, still going. Like it's it's just the starting of, of that. How do you imagine like to this one million price point? I think, uh, I mean, you've probably seen the tweets from Michael Dell where he's talking yeah. about Bitcoin. Uh, yeah. um, I actually wrote a thread about this today where a lot more companies, a lot more investors, prominent investors are going to wrap their heads around Bitcoin. They're going to try looking at it. They're going to figure it out and they're going to get their companies to buy it or they're going to buy it for themselves. Michael Dell has uh, $105 billion or something like that of his own. And he's, he's what the CEO, the founder of Dell, right? And he can easily, his goal is to, earn his shareholders as much profit as possible, as much as high returns as possible. And he, he gets a benefit out of that because he owns stock options. He owns shares. Um, so he benefits from it. If he sees that micro strategy is tripling, quadrupling, 10 xing in price, then why wouldn't he follow the same strategy that micro strategy is following? It doesn't really make any sense not to, uh, after, I think after Dell, once Dell actually starts, because Michael Dell on his own has what eight something like I was actually looking at his page today. He has like eight hundred thousand uh, followers. So even if all of the people that are following him or the people that you've had on your podcast, if all these people buy even a fraction of Bitcoin, the price is going to increase significantly because over time there's less coins available on exchanges. There's less available to be bought. Uh, the the amounts that are the amounts that are available at the current prices are going to keep de decreasing over time. They're going to keep decreasing. But the thing is that with Bitcoin, you can buy fractions. You can buy tiny, tiny fractions if you want to. So even if you buy one cent worth, if you want to buy one cent worth, if you want to buy one Nigerian Naira's worth, you can. You can't do that with any other asset. You can't do that with real estate. You can't do that with stocks. Also, there's the fact that um, all these other asset classes, real estate is worth $400 trillion dollars. There are people who own hundreds or even thousands of properties. If they even sell a fraction of their properties and they put it into Bitcoin, we could see the price increase significantly, right? Uh, and I think that's what's going to happen. I think most people will keep ignoring Bitcoin. I think most very, very wealthy investors will continue to ignore Bitcoin until it reaches $100,000. And then at $100,000, they're going to start studying it. They're going to put a small fraction of their wealth into it. And as they do that, the FOMO rises. FOMO keeps increasing, keeps increasing until we see a hundred. I think it could take one cycle to get to a million dollars because from zero to 70,000, it's much harder. <clears throat> it's much harder to start from zero. Zero to one is much harder than it is to go from one to 10 or one to 100, right? Even when we start both, when you started your YouTube channel, you probably noticed it's harder for you to go from zero to a hundred subscribers than it is to go from 5,000 to 6,000. Right, and you use you recently hit that, but you you noticed you noticed that because that's just how compounding works. So exactly the same thing with Bitcoin. We're going to see um, more and more people. Right now, I think something like maximum of five percent of the world's population owns Bitcoin. This five percent, I, I think it's significantly less than that. Most people don't understand it. A lot of the people who own Bitcoin today are going to sell it. They're going to sell early because they don't truly understand it. So they're going to be part of the people who, I guess, lost out. Um, but over time, we're going to see that more and more people pile into it. More and more people have thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars set aside. They can just put all of it into it. The ETFs has made it a lot easier, and we're going to see that. I, I think we could see a million dollars by twenty thirty. 
And I don't think by 2030, we're going to have 15, 20% adoption. Mm. Yeah, right. I think this this example is really good. Um, just for context, because you mentioned my podcast, I needed one month to gain the first 20 subscribers, <laughs> like a whole yeah. month. This is now what I get sometimes in an hour if if some video does good. Uh, yeah. Like when like when the Michael Saylor video uh, was released, I gained a thousand in like uh, six days or five days or something like that. Like that, that's like crazy, like the compounding, uh, effects of like networking and stuff like that. This is also for money and it's even more for money because money is like the most viral thing ever in our society. Uh, and another thing that happens like when the price, like you, you mentioned the 800,000, uh, followers of, of, of Michael Dell, like not only if, if the followers, they, they're buying something, but he has a lot of buddies who are also really, really rich and have a lot of money and a lot of influence. Those are also influencing a lot of things. And then when the price goes up, all of a sudden the, the Bitcoin content creators, like a podcast, let, let's, let's take this podcast, for example, uh, when there's some, uh, pop star with like a million followers, uh, coming out and saying like, oh, Bitcoin is a thing and they want to be on a, on Bitcoin podcast. And they're like, oh, let's see the five, 10 best Bitcoin podcasts. And they're like, Hey, contact them. And they, they are on, on them. Of course, Th this brings new people in like, like this is a, a, a such an, an amazing cycle from a social standpoint, but also from a financial standpoint. And, uh, yeah. Do, do you also think that a hundred thousand will, will trigger a lot of this, this, this momentum? I feel like hundred thousand is like a thing. A lot of people are waiting for to really make a, a huge impact in the society. It would be really interesting if we hit a hundred thousand, like Q end of Q3, something like that. I'm, I'm looking for, for that kind of a number. Yeah, no, I, I think that I think that 100k will definitely um, bring up some emotional investing. It'll people will buy it because they're feeling emotional. They're they're feeling the FOMO. They're feeling the greed. Um, but what I think what's going to happen is a lot of people are going to put, let's say, one percent towards Bitcoin uh, at these prices, for example. And then at a hundred thousand dollars, they're going to see, oh, this is not a joke. Maybe I should start learning more about this. I think at $100,000, what's going to happen is a lot of people who are creating content are going to see their subscribers, their videos blow up like crazy. But then with it takes time to understand how Bitcoin works, right? You, you don't go from, let's say, 1% to 100% overnight. It takes a long, long time. It takes a very long time. Like for me, it took like three years, right? It took me three years to sell my stocks up until I think August, I have a podcast, I have a podcast with uh, Simply Bitcoin, where uh, I was talking about how real estate and Bitcoin don't commit, uh, they don't compete. Right? Now, I created a video yesterday, I just made a video yesterday that directly contradicts what I said in that last podcast, because I figured it out, I understood how it works. And I think over time, more and more people are going to see this, but at that $100,000 level, it's going to open more people's eyes because right now they, they see that, oh, it's five figures. They think that 10,000 versus 90,000 is the same thing because it's still five figures, right? But when it hits six figures, that's where that uh, psychological impact happens. And then at a million, because what's going to happen is those people who are figuring it out at $100,000, they're going to buy those that 1%, 2%. I actually had a ton of people messaging me over the last few days uh, because I've been posting about it regularly. People telling me, hey, I started buying Bitcoin. I wanted 60,000, finally got it as I put, I started my dollar cost average. Um, more people are going to start doing that, right? People who I haven't touched, people who your your podcast has touched over time, you're, you're probably, uh, how many views are you getting a month? 100,000, 200,000, 200, right? right? Think about it. Those 200,000, whoever, whoever's seen those videos, they're becoming more and more convicted every single video they watch. Every single video they see, every single perspective, every single opinion, every single content creator has their own opinions to add. All the, I think that's one of the important things about Bitcoin podcasts, right? I, I think the the important thing about some something like yours is that you have so many different people with different backgrounds on your conversations. What Bitcoin did, same thing. Preston Pish, same thing. All these podcasts, same thing. But it's not it's not the same content. I'm saying that the idea is that the more more people that you have exposure to, 
the more people you can learn from, the faster you get to the end, the faster you start accumulating to Bitcoin. I think having those different opinions, because think about it, there are a lot of people who can relate to me. Maybe they're Indian, maybe they have the same background as me, maybe they have a finance background, maybe they're confused about Bitcoin. Same thing with a lot of your guests. Maybe there's people who are doing one thing or another, they can relate to this guy, this guy changed their opinion, and now they're now they're a Bitcoiner, right? It just happens over time. As, as more people understand it, more content creators, it's, it compounds. It, it's gonna keep compounding. The network is gonna keep growing, it's gonna keep getting bigger. And in that, in that time, you also have to see that uh, the U.S. dollars, the U.S. government is going to keep printing dollars, uh, borrowing dollars. The Federal Reserve is going to keep printing dollars, adding it to the economy. At some point, I wouldn't be surprised if the Federal Reserve starts printing dollars to buy Bitcoin. And I wouldn't be surprised if that happens before 90% of the mass, the, the public owns Bitcoin, right? And that's when we see that massive increase. That's when we see that. I don't know if we're going to have an Omega candle. I think they're smart enough to just do it over time, but there could be something. It's, it's all game theory, right? Somebody could come out. You'd never know how, what China is planning to do tomorrow, what Russia is planning to do tomorrow. Um, you you don't know what Japan's going to do. What if Japan goes and sells all their treasuries because the yen is getting wrecked? They sell all their treasuries. They exchange it all for Bitcoin, right? They have something like a trillion dollars worth of treasuries. If they did that, what would happen to Bitcoin? It's not like Bitcoin's price is going to double if they put a trillion dollars into Bitcoin, right? The Bitcoin's price is going to 10x, 15x, because if they put it all in at once, it changes everything. It is, is, is this the final straw that has to happen when uh, central banks, especially the big ones like the Federal Reserve, the ECP, are printing fiat currencies to actually buy Bitcoin and put it on their balance sheet, even if it's just 1% or 5% or something like that? Yeah, I think that's probably going to happen after CBDCs. I think CBDCs are going to come. They're going to flop. Nobody's going to want to. I mean, people are, I think there's always going to be a lot of people who end up using them, but I have a feeling that they're not going to do as well as governments think they will, central banks think they will, and they're going to be forced into buying Bitcoin. It's 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 a common phrase, right? All lo All roads lead to Bitcoin. CBDCs are going to eventually lead to Bitcoin. When people see that, oh, uh, my money is being canceled after six months, or I'm getting a negative yield on my savings. Why would they want to continue holding their CBDC? And then again, our podcasts, our channels, all the content that we're putting out, all the content that everybody else is putting out, Bram, uh, what's his name? Alessio, um, Fred, Fred Kruger, all the, all this content is it, just leading to one road. Right, no matter how far out on the shitcoin route you are, it always leads to Bitcoin. Right, it always leads. To, I, I think uh, even math. You know Matthew Crater, Bitcoin University. Yeah, Bitcoin. Yeah. He posted a video today about Caspa, uh, how Caspa is uh, a shitcoin essentially, and I hadn't done the deep dive. He did the deep dive. He did a great job on it. And over time, we're gonna see more and more people calling out the scam coins. Right, we're going to see this over time, and more and more people will be forced into buying Bitcoin because nothing else is worth anything. Nothing else is worth buying. A lot of people, like I, always encourage people to create content. Like uh, every guest that comes on and he does not con create content, I'm like, hey, you have such a great voice, go out and create content. Uh, and I even inspired like right now free people that actually are in the process of starting their own podcast mm -hmm. and starting their own content creation journey. Uh, and a lot of people ask me then, like, oh, like, why are you doing that? You, you're creating competition for yourself because there are other content creators. And I don't see it that way. I think we, we have uh, a greater mission to do. And I like to have as many soldiers on my side uh, as possible. Like, we, we, we are in the same boat. <laughs> we are all doing the same thing. If, uh, if other Bitcoin podcasts get more views, we, we all gain from that and that's the great thing with, with bitcoin voices that that's like i always try to push as many bitcoin voices as possible i have 10 or 15 percent of my guests are people that never have been on any podcast before like, wow. like not not on any podcast i reached out to a subscriber who leaves great comments and said to him hey i would love to get your perspective on the podcast and he was amazing 
I loved it as so, because he, he really le left like that much of comments, like on every second video or something like that. I was like, yeah, he has yeah. such insights. I want to get him on the podcast. I, would, I want to travel with him. And it wasn't a great podcast. And that's why I'm, I'm really bullish on uh, what you just said. And I wanted to highlight that with like getting more voices out there because he is someone uh, uh, that someone else relates to. Because if I only have like the same 50 people over and over again on a podcast, uh, this is just like a, uh, how can you say, like we, we're only in a bubble and we never expand outside and we never get a new voices. So I always will have uh, around twos with people like with you now and around three with people. But I always want to have completely new people on my podcast because this first like expands my my view but this leads to bitcoin adoption because when we get new voices out there this this creates something uh even if it's a michael sale in 2020 he became a popular new voice uh or someone else on a smaller scale like that's that's amazing because uh we are on a mission here and, and I, I love that a lot that uh that we can do this all together and, and spread bitcoin as michael sailor says it with love and not not hate <laughs> oh yeah i i feel like um I feel like thinking of it as, as competition isn't the right way. I think a lot of people think of it that way, but that's not the right way. I like how you think of it. I actually feel like uh, if you tell people to create content, it actually makes your content do even better because when there's more people who are talking about Bitcoin, they get recommended to people in their feeds. And then when they get recommended in their feeds, the alg I mean, the YouTube algorithm is smart enough to know that this person likes this person's content. So maybe we'll push this person, maybe we'll push Rob's content to this person. Maybe we'll push it to, to this mutual connection. So I, I feel like it just, the network just gets bigger, right? It's not like anybody loses, right? As you, in, as you increase the, as you increase the, the amount of content available on YouTube, more and more people want to watch it. More and more people get bored and they want to find new YouTube accounts that can talk to people. And everybody has their own, story everybody has their own skills everybody uh, has their own perspective their own biases there's always going to be somebody who can relate to you right there's always going to be somebody there's there's never going to be somebody who can't you're, you're never i think that's the problem with with a lot of social media people think that oh i posted two three times why am i not going viral it doesn't work that way uh like my first if you go through my old videos man they were terrible because i didn't know how to edit I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to create a script. I didn't know how to, uh, speak confidently. My videos, like I, I'm stuttering in half of videos. It's, it's so bad, but then over time you get better. You just get better over time as you get better. More and more people want to see your content. And like, like, like with what you did, maybe out of those 10%, 15%, there's going to be somebody who creates the next, what Bitcoin did. And maybe they discover something brand new, right? They discover a brand new way of looking at Bitcoin and it changes more perspectives. Love it a lot. Um, back to the, uh, the the one thing that I uh, forgot before when we talked about the Bitcoin price. Um, it, it's it's price targets are always interesting for me because like one it's 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 important I think to talk about a little bit because this is how people outside of Bitcoin measure the success of Bitcoin how how high the price goes and they also want to grasp uh, the potential of bitcoin in like 10 years 20 years 50 years uh, so bitcoin price is a tricky one for me because i myself i would not even know what i would sell for so why would i create a price target but i also have in mind that i'm in a small bubble mm -hmm. and 99.9 percent .9 of the world wants to know what the price one day will be on Bitcoin, even Bitcoiners. And that's why I think it's even important as a Bitcoiner to talk about the US dollar because the US dollar is still the reality for most people and they are thinking about that. Even I live in Austria and in, in, in a Euro country and still US dollar is kind of seen as like the, the main u unit of account. Um, what kind of price target uh, would you put on on Bitcoin in like really 20 years, maybe 30 years outside of this 1 million price target? So the way that I look at it, I think uh, I think once there's 10% adoption, 
the nine the re, the other ninety percent are going to adopt very quick because the ten percent are going to adopt because they have certain incentives. So let's say uh, okay, so let's say I bought uh, the Bitcoin Standard. I thought I had it with me, but let's say I bought the Bitcoin Standard and I wanted to read this book, and I'm buying it from Saifedean Amus's uh, publishing house, and Saifedean is giving me a discount for buying Bitcoin, for buying with Bitcoin, for paying with Bitcoin. What that does is it saves him money for transaction fees. And if I don't have Bitcoin already, I'm going to buy Bitcoin to use it and I'm going to send it to him. And he's probably never going to sell it again. Right. So over time, I think what the, what's going to happen is that 10 percent, they're going to see the benefits of receiving Bitcoin as payments. A lot of the I think a lot of the I think part of the reason why um, a lot of Bitcoiners are very productive is because they have that entrepreneurial mindset. If you're an entrepreneur, you're trying to decrease your costs, right? And part of decreasing costs as a business is to decrease the expenses that you have to pay for payment processing, right? So with with those first 10%, I think what's going to happen is uh, a lot of these people are going to be merchants who are giving 5, 10, 15% discounts for buying products with Bitcoin because, first of all, they don't have to pay credit card fees. Secondly, they don't have to invest the money so they can just get more money and then they can keep it in that in that form they can put it on a lightning wallet just leave it on lightning or they can uh move it from lightning after they get to a certain amount they can move it to their wallet and they have to pay that transaction fee once but that transaction fee is a flat fee they're not paying a percentage so that makes a massive difference i was actually uh i was looking into how much money visa makes from uh from credit card processing visa makes more in profits than Walmart, right? So when you think about that, what does Visa do? Visa is literally just a uh, a payment processor. That's it. They're, Database. They're, they're, exactly. That's that's literally it. They're, all they're doing is they're uh, helping us process transactions. They're giving us a way to move our wealth from one place to the other. So if you wanted to pay Amazon without Visa, how would you do it? You'd have to go to their head office. You'd have to go to their uh, headquarters to make a payment. If you if we were using gold, you have to go to their headquarters to give them that piece of gold because you can't send it over over the Bitcoin network, right? So what's going to happen is, I think payment. Pro I, I think merchants are going to see the benefits of this. They're going to see the benefits of just getting Bitcoin, not having to deal with all these payment processors. A lot of people think that oh, it's because they're trying to avoid taxes. I don't think that it, I don't think that's it. When you have when you have Bitcoin, I think eventually at a point you're going to be so far in the green that you don't give a shit about taxes. Right. Taxes don't matter because at that point you have so much money that you can live your life comfortably. You can pay your taxes. You can get the government off your back. It doesn't really make a difference. You're not going to try to avoid taxes if you have a, a few hundred thousand dollars right? or a few, a few, a, maybe a few million dollars. You don't you don't care about taxes for a couple of Bitcoin. But I think what that's what that's going to do is it's going to trigger a lot of people to buy Bitcoin to pay their favorite merchant with it. Right. And what that's going to do again is it's going to concentrate wealth with the people who are producing value and the people who continue to produce value over time. And then those people like me and you, uh, if you have a, an employee, for example, and we're on a Bitcoin standard, you're probably going to pay them with Bitcoin. You're going to save your time. You're going to use them to instead of editing your own videos. Maybe you're going to pay somebody to edit your videos instead of spending 10, 20 hours to do it. You're going to pay some editor a little bit of Bitcoin because of the value that they're giving you because of the time that they're saving. You're going to give them Bitcoin. You're going to redistribute it that way. I think that's what's going to happen. And we're going to go from 10% to 90% to, to maybe not 90, maybe like 70, 80% very quickly. I think we're, it may take up until maybe 2030 to get to that 10% and then maybe 2035 to get to 90%. I don't know if that's going to happen. I mean, let's, let's see what happens. Could be completely different, but price, we, we went into this tangent because of the price. So I think by 2030, we could see a million, but maybe I'm being too bullish here. I don't know. I mean, there's a possibility that we could see a million by the end of 2024 for all we know, right? Nobody has any clue. Nobody knows how much Bitcoin will be on the market at hundred K. What if fewer people want to sell their Bitcoin at hundred K than they want to do than they want to sell now, right? We don't know. We don't know what the supply side is going to be like. All we know is that new supplies decreasing. We know that the majority of people don't own any. And we know that these people eventually 
will very likely have to own Bitcoin. And if they don't, they can't participate in the economy. So with just those factors in mind, I mean, we could easily see the US dollar collapse by 2035, right? I mean, that could be way too bullish on Bitcoin. But then the thing is that once you understand how Bitcoin works, once you understand game theory, once you understand how money works, once you understand the, the economy, once you understand price signals, it's very difficult not to see it that way. It's it's fascinating for me when when you think about. Do, do you think with when when you say the fiat is collapsing, uh, are you saying we're switching the whole system to Bitcoin, or the the Bitcoin price just vents up parabolic, but we still use this to pay taxes, the the US dollars, we we still use the US dollar as a currency. I don't honestly, I don't think the US government is going to want to take US dollars in taxes. It won't make sense for them, right? Why would they? I mean. I, I mean, this seems so abstract. It seems so crazy. It doesn't even seem like it's a real, like we're having a, we're talking about a real future here. To most people, they don't even think of it that way, right? But if you, I, I've, I've been actually, I've actually been thinking about this for a, for a while now, but why would it make sense for the US government to keep getting taxes in US dollars if the rest of the world is saving, if all the other central banks are saving in Bitcoin? Why wouldn't they want to, get that wealth. It's like the, um, I forgot, Gresham's Law, is that what it is? Good money chases out bad money? Uh, bad money I don't know about Gresham. Good money or something like that. But basically, uh, the bad money is being used. People are getting rid of it as quickly as possible. And the good money is being hoarded. It's being stored. So the US government has that power. They have that monopoly over violence where they can force people to pay in Bitcoin. They can threaten them with violence. They can say, if you don't pay your taxes in Bitcoin, we don't want dollars anymore. If you don't pay your taxes in Bitcoin, then we don't, we don't accept, accept your payment, right? Cause at that point, maybe dollars will be worthless. Like I said, this could be such an, uh, a crazy abstract situation. Maybe it's not even going to happen this way. Maybe it's not even gonna be close to this, but I mean, there's, there's always a possibility, right? There's a possibility that the U S government adopts Bitcoin just to avoid giving bricks any steam, right? Any, any of that compounding, like we're talking about compounding the, the reason why we even use a currency is because everybody else uses it. If the U S government keeps printing, they keep printing. Maybe they're, maybe they are this arrogant, who knows? Maybe, maybe they do think that they're the only ones who can create that, that world reserve currency, but if they keep printing, keep printing. They're giving more people an incentive to move to move to something else. They're probably not going to push bricks. Why would they push? Uh, currency of a country that, or not country, countries that are directly competing with them. So to them, I think because Bitcoin is that neutral currency, we're going to see the U.S. government adopt Bitcoin much sooner than people expect. People think that Bitcoin is going to get banned by the U.S. government, but, I, but that doesn't really make any sense because I feel like the U.S. government has smart enough people on its payroll that they will figure out what Bitcoin is. And maybe maybe this election will will be the trigger for that. How do you see the, the election to be the, the trigger of that? Uh, it's possible. Yeah, 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 it's possible. It's definitely possible because if uh, I, there's a lot of people who are single issue voters, right? A lot of people, I'm not American. I know you're not American. Uh, a lot of people who are in America, they understand Bitcoin and they're only going to vote for whoever wants to wants to promote Bitcoin, right? And they're not going to vote for the other party. If there's one party that's completely against Bitcoin and the other party is completely for Bitcoin, they're obviously going to vote for the people who are for it. And apparently there's something like 50 million people in the U.S. who own Bitcoin or who are in cryptocurrencies who own cryptocurrencies. And that's 50, that's what, maybe 20%, maybe more than 20% of the voting population. Yeah, I think right. they have like 300 uh, million population. Is that Something wrong? Like but, that, then, yeah. but, but then there's also people who are under, under 18 who can't vote. People like people, just people in general who can't vote. But then th that's like 20, 30 percent of the voting population. That's right? massive. So, right. That's crazy. Like when, when you put it in that perspective, like you, like you said, 300 million. So we let's say we get rid of 20 percent for people who can't vote, uh, 240 million, 50 million out of 240 million. That's like 
23, 22%. Thank you. You already made it halfway through the video and I'm really, really grateful to have you here. Two things make this channel possible. You as a watcher and listener who keep supporting this channel. And another one is all the Bitcoin brands that I partner up with, like 21 Bitcoin, who support me from the very start and where I personally buy my Bitcoin from. With code Robin, you even get a discount when you buy Bitcoin with them. And now also Bitbox. Bitbox is the simplest and securest way to secure your Bitcoin. And I heard a crazy statistics. Only 2% of Bitcoiners hold their Bitcoin in a hardware wallet. How crazy is that? Don't be in that 98% bracket. Be in the 2% bracket. And if you have self-custody and you know your friend does not have, maybe he needs a Christmas present. Maybe he needs a birthday present. And a small life hack, if you use code ROBIN, you get 5% off your order plus you support my channel. And now let's get back to the video. I just Google it, 244 million oh, Americans go. probably will be eligible for vote to, uh, for this for this election. And uh, usually, that's also one thing, usually, uh, oh, no, no, this is something else. But th then, like, fr from those uh, 244, not everyone gonna is going to vote. So if you yeah. really can mo mobilize Bitcoiners who, who have Bitcoin or have crypto to say, like, hey, I'm that pro Bitcoin and crypto candidate, if you want to... Uh, have that in the politics. You have to vote for me and you have to vote also. You really, like, this is a major power if you have this 50 million voters. And of course, of those 50 million people, not everyone, the number one priority is Bitcoin. But okay. if you actually have Bitcoin and you get Bitcoin, then Bitcoin is like, for me, a single issue voter. I am Austria and there's actually Austrian election coming up in September. Uh, I mean, it's so small, like no one in the world uh, cares about Austria because it's really small, but there is no real party for Bitcoin. Like I mm -hmm. read all the political parties, uh, but they, there's not really a, a one in there. But for what you said before, this was also really interesting. Um, when you said about game theory and, and the US will not push the bricks, because this will be the major advantage of Bitcoin, because US is not trusting anyone else. And... Uh, like in general, trust is not so much there between countries. We see with so many wars, when we see Russia, Ukraine, when we see other countries, there's not too many trusts inside, even in, in the, even inside of the European Union. There's so much conflicts happening and so much tension between those countries that are in the same union. Mm -hmm. So when nobody trusts each other, what, what are they going to choose? Something that they don't have to trust. It's like, it, that, that makes so much sense. Yeah, it's money for enemies, right? It's money. When people say, oh, why are you supporting BlackRock uh, buying Bitcoin? It's because we understand that this is money for everyone. You can't stop BlackRock from owning Bitcoin. You can't stop the wealthiest people in the world from owning Bitcoin. All you can do is buy it yourself. You can't You can't uh, prevent somebody else from buying a Bitcoin. All you can do is somebody, I don't know who said this, but you can only ban yourself from buying Bitcoin. You can't ban anybody else. It's not my quote, but great quote, excellent quote, because it makes a lot of sense, right? You can't stop someone from memorizing 12 words. If somebody wants to own Bitcoin, they can own it. If they want to memorize these 12 or 24 words, they can do it. Nobody can stop them. Nobody can prevent them from doing that. You talked before that uh, in the beginning of the podcast about that you uh, had the opinion that Bitcoin is not competing with real estate, but then you changed it and you had the podcast interview with uh, or the podcast with Simply uh, Bitcoin TV. What what changed there? What made you think like, oh, Bitcoin is actually sucking up the financial energy of everything? Why why is the value lost in in real estate and stocks and other? Uh, things wise, Bitcoin, they are so superior. And what made you change that opinion? So I used to work as a, uh, as a realtor. I used to work as a, as a real estate agent. Um, I, I used to work, so I used to work at uh, TD, uh, TD Bank as a bond analyst. I hated that job. So I left it. Uh, I wanted to see what you can do as a, I thought I was a good salesperson. I thought I'd find it interesting. So I thought, okay, maybe I'll do real estate. So I started selling real estate, but I realized that a lot of realtors don't actually know why their customers are buying real estate. They have no idea, right? So they're telling these people that, oh, you can buy this property. I've, I've heard conversations with uh, realtors, like well-known realtors and their customers. They've told them, oh, the property value is going to go up no matter what. It's going to go up forever. 
It's going to keep going. You're always going to be able to get rent. You're, there's always going to be some sucker out there who's willing to pay you three, four, five, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars, whatever the rent is at the time. There's always going to be somebody out there that can do that. But uh, I think once you zoom out, once you really look at what they're doing, you see that's a Ponzi scheme, right? It's pretty easy to see. And the Ponzi scheme, uh, the bottom layer of that Ponzi scheme, the uh, the bottom layer of that Ponzi scheme is renters. Above that is landlords. Above that is banks. And above that is the government. Government is earning property taxes. So they want property values to go up. Banks are earning interest and they can give out bigger loans. So they want property values to go up. Landlords uh, want property values to go up. So they make more money. But then at the bottom, there's people who are renting those properties. They can't buy the property. So what they're doing is they're renting the properties, they're paying whatever the rent, the market rental rate is. And eventually those people won't be able to afford it anymore. It's just, you can't, you can't increase minimum wage by 2% a year when rent is going up 12, 13, 15% a year. So all these people, what if, I don't know if you've noticed this trend, but there's a lot more people who are camping in their cars. They can't afford to buy a house. They can't afford to pay rent because they don't want to work in. They don't want to work eighty hours to pay for rent. When they can just live in their car, they can live a minimalist life. I know they're not doing it by choice, but thing is that they're doing it. And what this is going to do is it's going to make more and more people want to avoid having to pay rent because rent is killing their lives. It's taking their entire life away, right? And what I see is so the the main thing that I see here is that. Real estate prices are going to decrease because the only reason why you have to buy real estate is because the U.S. dollar doesn't work. Once the U.S. dollar is replaced, you can use Bitcoin as a savings tool. You don't need real estate anymore. You don't, you don't need to buy real estate because on a Bitcoin standard, house prices will continue to go down forever. Uh, I don't know if you want to. Maybe you can share the price in Bitcoin 21. Um the, you know the price in Bitcoin 21, the charts? Uh, Bit the Bitcoin price of uh, was in 21 or what? Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, actually, yeah. let me share it. Let me share it. I'll, I'll share it quickly. Hey. It's the, actually, let me send you, it's this priced in Bitcoin 21. I don't know if you've seen this website. So priced in Bitcoin 21, you can actually use this for a lot of your, your content. Maybe a lot of, I don't know if you've seen this before, but basically shows you the prices for everything. So the price of a house in terms of US dollars has decreased by 99.9%. Right. And if you own that house, a house was worth in 2011, a house was worth 64,000 Bitcoin. Today, that same house is worth seven Bitcoin, regardless of how much rent you got, regardless of how much uh, tax benefits you got, regardless of how many tax breaks you got from owning that real estate, you're never going to be able to get back 64,000 Bitcoin. I think you I think you're muted. Oh, sorry. Is that oh, that a website? Uh, yeah, the yeah, price yeah, exactly. This is it. Well, we have to go. Uh, uh, go to housing? Uh, yeah, housing. Yeah, and then you can see UK housing, and then you can see US. So if you go to US, and then you just hit all at the top there, and change the at the bottom, you see those orange uh, those orange tabs. Just change it from Sats to turn that off, just so it's a little easier to see. But now, if you go to August 2011, so right at the beginning of this chart, uh, the, and then go to the line, hover over, yeah, there you go. So you can see here, 26,000 Bitcoin for one house. If you go, if you go a little bit further to the, to the right, just go to the very top there, uh, move to the, sorry, move to the, move to the left. Oh, sorry, your left, move to the right. That's what I should have said. Okay. What, what, whatever it is, but at, at a point. A house was worth 64,000 Bitcoin at the very top there. Yeah, yeah, right there. 64,000 Bitcoin. That's crazy. Right? And now wow. there's a lot of people who are arguing, oh, you can get tax benefits. Um, you can get rental income, cash flow, whatever the, whatever the excuses are. But the rental income, the cash flow, the tax benefits are not going to get you to the 64,000 Bitcoin that you could have had. Right. So right now, one house costs 6.8 Bitcoin. I was doing the calculations on this. There's something like 150 million houses in the US. 
And out of those 100 million or 150 million, 10% are unoccupied. Meaning if, if somebody sold, if those 10% of houses were sold for Bitcoin, what would happen to the price of housing and what would happen to the price of Bitcoin? Price of Bitcoin would skyrocket. Price of housing would drop like crazy because like I said, there's 15 million unoccupied houses just in the US. But then there's also 2.4 billion houses in the entire world. And right now you can barely find a place where you can buy a house for less than one Bitcoin. If this is the global money, if this is the form of money for the entire world, why would you want to hold real estate? That I think that's just putting all that together. Why would you want to hold something that's going to depreciate? What, why would you want to hold something that you know is going to decrease in value over time? Is it, you, you said uh, renters are on the downside of, of the pyramid. Uh, yeah. But it's still better to own actual Bitcoin. So you would also suggest to like just pay rent uh, if you have the choice. Like there, there might be a lot of people in the audience who like, oh, I would have the financial means to go ahead and buy a house for, for myself just to use it uh, or an apartment. Uh, but I'd rather pay the rent and own 100% of, of my Bitcoin and, and be all in. Would you also suggest that or would you even go ahead, okay, like your own house you can own, but the majority of your net worth should be in Bitcoin. I personally, I personally own my own house, so I can't tell people to, that they should rent. I think it's more of a personal uh, decision. So if somebody wants, if somebody feels like renting is right for them, they should rent. If somebody feels like uh, owning is right for them, but eventually, but you know for a fact that the value of your house is going to decrease over time. So if if it were me, if I were to do it again, if I knew about Bitcoin because we bought this house in like 2019 or something like that. Um, but if I were to do it again, if I knew about Bitcoin back then, maybe Bitcoin would have been my choice and maybe I would have been able to buy, uh, instead of buying this house, buy 20 Bitcoin, right? And then that 20 Bitcoin is now worth 10 X what the house is worth. And I could just pay off the house. I could just buy the house. I could just buy it outright for maybe 10 or five Bitcoin or something like that. Get, get a loan against the house and buy Bitcoin, yeah. and then uh, with with uh, one tenth of the Bitcoin, get get the house back. <laughs> there you go. That see that works too. Exactly. However you do it, I, I feel like it. I feel like everybody has their own risk tolerance. Like if you're okay with taking that risk, then that's smart. I don't know if most people are willing to take that risk. That's the only thing. I think housing is great uh, if you're using it as a primary residence because you have some stability, right? You know for a fact that you're cost of living won't increase dramatically overnight. Um, on the other hand, a rent, a, a landlord could increase your rent, give you 60 days notice, 90 days notice, tell you, you have to pay $400 more or you're out. And if you can't afford that $400, what are you going to do? Yeah. Right. It's, right. it's, it's so, it's such, so easy when you think about it. Yeah. And then I think one of the other things is when we use housing as, uh, as an investment, anybody who's renting, their cost of living is proportionally with needs and wants their cost of living is their, their cost of living going towards their needs, their necessities. So they can't even enjoy life, right? More of their income is going towards their needs. Meaning that let's say if your rent goes up 20%, but your income only went up by 2%, you have to cut something out. There's something that you have to cut out. What is it that you're going to cut out? You're going to cut out entertainment. Are you going to cut out healthy foods? Are you going to start eating processed junk? Are you going to get rid of, um, what do you, what are you going to get rid of? That's, that's pretty much it, right? You have to get rid of entertainment. There's something you have to cut out, but then on the other side of it, the people who own these houses, they're able to excessively be entertained, excessively consume, right? So I think the, once, once you just put the pieces together, you see that housing being an investment is one of the main reasons for the wealth gap, right? It sounds crazy. It, it sounds absolutely insane to somebody who doesn't understand Bitcoin, to somebody who hasn't seen Bitcoin from this lens, from but for, for somebody who just sees the world from that US dollar lens, it sounds just nuts. It's, it, it sounds like you're just insane. But then once you study it, it's like, okay, it makes a lot of sense. I fully agreed. Do, do you see a risk that um, the 
And we have now a, a, only a small amount of people actually in Bitcoin. And then an even smaller amount of people uh, have a lot of Bitcoin. Uh, I mean, a significant amount of their own net worth in Bitcoin. Uh, it's like a really small amount, I feel like. Um, do you see a risk where the, there's a smaller group of people who have a lot of wealth uh, in the future and those will be the new elites and the new uh, kind of what we are now uh, saying that's bad, that BlackRock and all those things like <laughs> do you feel like that at some point Bitcoiners will be that at least and that a new revolutionary group is fighting against that or is is why because we have now fair money and it's not a pyramid scheme it's not it's it's proof of work and not proof of stake uh, that that this actually is is changing I think there's a difference um, so when BlackRock owns all of these stocks when it owns these stocks for, for on behalf of its customers. BlackRock can vote on things. It can choose to invest in certain co companies. I think there was, I, I was watching a, a video at some point where uh, they were saying how BlackRock actually threatens companies to do certain things or they'll pull their investment or like ESG investing, for example, they, they tell them do this or we'll take our money out. Um, you can't really do that with Bitcoin, right? Because people aren't forced to invest. They don't have to, they can literally take self custody and they don't have to give it, they don't have to give their Bitcoin to anyone. If they die, their Bitcoin goes with them if they don't share it with anybody, right? Their Bitcoin goes with them. So I think it's a little different. There's also the, the aspect of if you want to spend your Bitcoin, you actually have to give away your Bitcoin. On the fiat currency system, you can keep your assets forever. You can let, oh, there was, there was this, uh, there was this video that I saw where uh, it was, I think it was a, a host from Saturday Night Live from SNL. He was saying how Elon Musk doesn't have to pay capital gains taxes on his Tesla shares, but then he can use his Tesla shares as collateral to buy Twitter. So they're not there when he has to pay capital gains taxes, but then they're there when he can use them as collateral. So it is, it's kind of a, it's just a weird way to do things. You can use this as collateral, but you don't have to pay taxes on it. So you don't have to contribute to society, but you can use it to keep getting wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. That Again, that's part of the, the reason for the wealth gap. Same thing with houses, right? Uh, you can borrow against a house. You don't have to pay taxes, but then you, you, can, you don't have to sell that house. You have to pay taxes when you sell it. So what people are doing is instead of having to pay those taxes, they're just borrowing against their houses. They're keeping this house forever because they know that housing is a basic human need and they'll be able to exploit someone to pay them rent forever. Right. But that's, I think that's one of the things the people at the bottom are only going to take it for so long. Eventually there will be so many people at the bottom that there will be better solutions, more entrepreneurs. I guarantee you somebody who's been renting for the last 30 years is going to find a way to build houses faster. I had a conversation with someone who, um, he, he wants to build modular homes. He actually has a company. Um, and the reason why he wants to do it is because housing is so expensive and his family was never able to own a home. They were never, never able to, they always rented. And because of this, he wants to increase the supply of houses and he's working on it. He's actually going to make it happen. So I think he's, he's also a Bitcoiner, which is really cool. So. I think eventually these people who are Bitcoiners, people who are seeing these problems, they're going to change how the world works. They're going to change how real estate is used. Instead of using real estate as a savings tool, as a bank account, we're going to start using real estate for what it is, a living space. Uh, I think every, uh, anyone that says real estate is limited or like the supply of real estate is limited, uh, never went to uh, the uh, to some like Dubai, for example. There was Land. no nothing, and they yeah. just built a city where so many people are now living. I just drive through Austria, and there are uh, f like even such a small area. There are places where there's like two houses, and then there's like ten minutes of drive, no no house, and uh, like there's so many expansion possibilities. And then we have the possibilities of even going to another planet. I mean, this is far in the future, but if like we have so much space on Earth, so uh, so much that we can build so many new things there, then we can go 
above and a little bit be, uh, beyond even there. Uh, and then we can go even uh, to other planets. So like real estate is not scarce in, in that no. sense. It's, it's, it, may, it, it feels logical because you, you know the world and you're like, oh, it's a limited space. And it's like, oh, I know there cannot be more. I think the normal people can wrap their head around that, but it actually does not make sense. Uh, really interesting. Yeah. Completely. Uh, perfect. Then, um, before we end, we have a, a new end routine uh, that I think last time with, with you I did not have till now, uh, which is interesting. Maybe I had it. I, I cannot actually remember, but I will ask you anyways. Um, we have a new end routine before the actual end routine where I asked every guest on my podcast now, what are you currently passionate about besides Bitcoin? Like, what are you doing or learning uh, or activity-wise uh, besides uh, Bitcoin? Uh, so this is a conversation that uh, we were talking about this before. It's something that I'm passionate about right now is creating content on uh, on YouTube, creating long-form content. I, w I was never able to do that before. I, I feel like it's when you start doing it, you realize how much time goes into it, how much work goes into it to create something that people will actually watch. It's proof of work, right? Again, that's that's exactly what it is. But I'm very passionate about that. And I watched your video on the camera setup. Found that very helpful. That was that was an awesome video. I, I Link it here if you can. Link it somewhere here if you can, just so people can watch it. I will definitely like uh, it's, um, I don't know, you know, I think I'm, I said it new studio or something like that. A uh, new studio on two or something. I don't know. I think new studio or something was in the title. If, if people want to see it, I, I will try to link it uh, if I think about it when I edit. But yeah, I, it's. If it, I, we, we talked about it before when I recorded, but the amount of messages and DMs I got from that one video, even though I did not get a lot of views, it got less views than usual. Um, because I think people actually got something, uh, like they, they saw something behind the things, and then they're like, oh, this 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 video that you see, there's actually a lot of work behind that and a lot of thoughts behind that. How this this things look and and people that um, also do content creating, they they like it because they get value from it. The other people that don't do content creating, they even also got value because they see a little bit behind the scenes what's going on. So I like this kind of a style of a video, and uh, I'm I'm really glad that you're also now in the YouTube and and video creating format. It's, I think it's the best best kind of a content and you have the best kind of a connection with people uh, and uh, I enjoy Twitter but it's a little short like it's it's just a lot of short things uh, Instagram I never figured out I don't know uh, <laughs> how to how to do an Instagram I, I think I'm not I'm just not made for Instagram Twitter and YouTube I enjoy a lot and and the, these days I really enjoy YouTube like it's a it's a great place uh, and yeah podcasting then in general you can also upload it there and stuff like that uh, really cool. Um, perfect. Then let's come to the end routine where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest uh, without knowing who the next guest actually is. And your question from the previous guest is, do you think that somewhere out there in the universe are aliens which are more intelligent than humans? Yeah. If there's, if there's an outer space, then definitely. Uh, there has to be right the u.s i mean not the u.s the the earth can't be the only country that or sorry not the only country the, the only planet that can support life i'm sure there's uh another country another planet that can support life somewhere in the in the universe in the uh solar system whatever however far we go i'm sure there's at least one country i wouldn't be i wouldn't be surprised if there's another copy of earth Right, just another another exact same thing as the Earth, maybe slightly slightly different. But if there are aliens, maybe they're able to survive with different resources. Right, maybe they can use different resources from humans. Humans, uh, I think we have very specific needs. We can't really survive on other planets, but maybe the other maybe the other the other forms of life can survive without oxygen, without water. Maybe they have their own way of survival. Right. Well, what are your thoughts on this? I, I, I'm, I, this, that's actually a really good question, though. I had never even thought of that. Um, there's a lot of interesting uh, thoughts in my head around the topic because, first of all, like I'm 100 percent certain that there is something out there. I I, I refuse to uh, think that the human species is the most advanced species on on whatever we are, like the solar system, the planets, and everything. I think there's something more advanced out there. Probably, uh, I could be wrong, of course. Um, the scary thing is 
when there's like we are exploring planets, we are on the moon and stuff like that. Uh, and hopefully we do in the next 50 years more of that. But then when we look the other perspective, if there's actually something more advanced than humans out there, and they are the ones who are actually have great technology, what if they are already seeing Earth, like they're already like forms of that on Earth and, and just before, like before you really come to a planet, maybe you're just saying like one rocket uh, or like one f f few people or a few whatever they, they don't call them. It's like, it, it's not completely out of the realm that there are aliens already on Earth. Uh, it's, I, I don't think it is, but it's, it's not out of the possibilities. So it's, it's just explodes your mind when you think about it a lot. Uh, and uh, hopefully we get to the species before them because it means like whoever gets before the other planet is probably more advanced than the other species. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so there are a lot of interesting thoughts. I, I have no clue about aliens. I have no clue about other planets. Like I'm really bad uh, educated on that stuff. Yeah. I just yeah. refuse the thought that we are the only intelligent, like when you, even like when you see animals uh, uh, and when you see them, uh, how, how far they sometimes are close to the human beings. Uh, and, and I mean, you're coming from them, then you're like, Maybe there's something out there that, that is way far superior than, than humans because humans also have a lot of mistakes in, in, in them. Uh, so maybe there's something really great out there and, and we just don't know it yet. Like there's, I love that kind of a talk. And we're kind, we're constantly discovering new things, right? We're constantly discovering things that we never even thought of. Um, like let's say uh, when we discovered the internet, it's not like it didn't exist before that it existed, we just didn't know it was there, right? There's going to be a point where even with electricity, it existed, we just didn't know it was there. We didn't know how to use it. Fire, we didn't know how to create it. It existed. It's not like it, it didn't exist. Same thing with, I mean, same thing with Bitcoin, right? We, it would have already, it would have always existed. I think what Satoshi Nakamoto did was he just put together certain inventions and he used those inventions to show us that it exists, right? Now, 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 interesting question. Um, do you think it's possible that Satoshi Nakamoto is an alien? <laughs> See, this is something that I've, I've, uh, I've thought about. I, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's a, an alien. Maybe it's an AI, right? Maybe it's a uh, general intelligence. Uh, I think that's what it's called. The, is that what it's called? Um, uh, but basically where, Computers can think for themselves. They can have emotions and all that stuff. Maybe it's maybe it's some kind of uh, AI. Nobody has nobody knows what it is. But then there could also be the fact that it's health. Maybe it's health, any right? Maybe. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 way more likely that it's half in or some yeah. some actual human. It's right. way more likely. It's uh, fun but... though. It's fun to think about these things. It's it's really fun to to see where 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 your mind could take you. Uh, definitely, and uh, I had an episode. Uh, I don't. You probably don't know him. It's uh, he's called Ratoshi. Uh, oh yeah, and I, saw, like, I saw it. Oh, you saw the episode. Really cool. Uh, and and he has this vision that like rat. Like this is just sci-fi, sci like a uh, 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 fiction movie. But he is also writing like actual what could happen. And here's the the thing that Bitcoin mining will be ninety nine percent of all the energy use. Uh, mm -hmm. And he says that not because Bitcoin will eat up everything, but we will be really good in abstracting solar energy when we have like solar panels on Mercury and basically um, mining directly from the sun. Uh, and this will still be in a 10 minute video. I mean, I'm really uneducated what the planet system and that is. So like, I'm, I'm always feeling insecure when, I, insecure when I talk about that topic. But it's really interesting what he, he thought like in this episode, I feel like expanded my mind what's possible and he, f he said something like uh he can imagine because when we, we talked about before the price predictions but what we don't like almost nobody factors in what if we find other planets and other planets also use bitcoin and all of a sudden it's not 8 billion people it's maybe 80 billion people yeah or 200 billion people and we all kind of agree still that bitcoin is the thing and bitcoin is the uh the currency of the small planetary system where like two three planets are there uh, 
one Satoshi could be buying uh, like houses, uh, but it's like really far off. And he and he has this famous. I think it was even in the title. Uh, you will be able to buy with one Bitcoin a, a, a base a space station, <laughs> a solar system, or a, yeah, space station. That's what it was. But see, there, there could also be. Okay, let's look at this from a different perspective. This is gonna be fun. Um, what if, you know how we have shit coins? What if somebody came from another uh, another planet and they have their own form of Bitcoin, and they brought Bitcoin to this planet, and it's just a copy of something that's already existing and they're getting us to, I mean, again, this, this, it's so fun to think about these. It's so abstract. It's so interesting because I don't know if it's even possible, but maybe there's something here that we don't know. Maybe this is a bad note to end on, but maybe Bitcoin will fail because of that. Right. And this, Never is, this, know. this is the, this is the, the, the thing, like there's always a black swan event, but you should not just because of the black swan event, then uh, uh, diversify in shit coins and diversify yes. in, in, in depreciating assets that will not hold anything. Because guess what? If a black swan comes, an alien comes and they have the better money, and then we have to uh, dump Bitcoin because it's now Bitcoin is a shit coin and we have to adopt their coin that did not exist on Earth because it was not on Earth before, your house and your stocks are also going to zero. It's all worthless so, anyways, yeah. So, so, so you always have to find the best money, and yeah. if there's a better species coming and 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 bringing in like an even better form of money, however like this this looks like, yeah, then then we're just late and and we we, we fucked up. But <laughs> it's, it's, exactly, it's good like that, right? But at least we that's the thing. At least we took the chance, right? Very the chances of that happening are what zero point zero 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 one percent, maybe even less, zero point zero 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 one percent, but. I think I'm okay with that risk. <laughs> so right? you're okay if, if, if aliens come and, and forces us in a new monetary system. <laughs> I mean, if we have to do it, we have to do it, right? I'd rather not go to space prison, <laughs> right? I, I think that's a, it's, it's a fun and, and good note to end on our podcast. It is. Uh, it's, it's been a pleasure. We come from uh, what, what, how many people will be in Bitcoin when we reach 1 million to what happens if another <laughs> alien civilization <laughs> forces us a new monetary system on. Uh, it, it's been a fun conversation. Uh, thank you, Rajat, uh, for, for being on. When people want to ask you questions, when people want to reach out to you and, and watch your stuff, where's, where they can they find you? Where can people ask you questions? Uh, just check out my YouTube. have that. Um, I have my newsletter. Send me an email. Uh, yeah, I, Instagram, Twitter, just send me a message anywhere. I, I try to get to everything if I can. Sometimes I can't get to my messages, unfortunately, uh, but I'll try. I'll try as much as I can. It's just for my for my YouTube. It's just Rajat Sony Finance, I think it is. If you just search for that, you'll find me. Yeah, uh, I I did that today. If you put in uh, your name, uh, you pop up uh, oh, in the go. first place. So like that's uh, that's easy, and I will probably just link it down in the description. Uh, but Perfect. if you're really easily findable, then uh, thank you, Rajat, for for being on, and for everyone watching and listening. Thank you for for being here, and I'll be back tomorrow uh, with another episode. Bye bye. Thanks for having me, Robin. Yeah.